Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our CPL Sim 6 weekly podcast. I'm Sarnath. Joining me, as always, King Louis the Fourteenth, and our guest this week is Augathy. Go ahead and introduce yourselves, gentlemen. I am. Wow. Okay, go ahead. You go first, Augathy. I go first, or you go first? You, you can go first. I go, I'll go first. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just I'm Augathy. Okay, and King Louis is a really nice guy. Let me introduce myself first. But uh, I'm basically a regular player, I guess, on the CPL. I've played a lot. I, I had the chance to play with quite a few, uh, I guess, uh, high profile players, like uh, high skill players, but I don't consider myself one of them yet. And uh, I'm a fan of the podcast too, so I'm quite happy to be here today with uh, Sarnath and King Louis. I'm, I'm King Louis Fourteenth, and I'm, I'm a big fan of the podcast because I'm an egomaniac and uh, I like Civ <laughs> 6 and I'm, I try to be enthusiastically supporting it all the time. Awesome. And I'm not really, I'm not really an egomaniac. I just like to be silly. I mean, if you were not, like, you wouldn't listen to the show. Like, I know I, I listen to the show because you're there as well. I like Sarnit, Don't get me wrong, but Louis brings something to this show as well. So, so we got a ton of stuff to go over today, guys. And boy, oh boy, where to start? Um, first off, I want to start off by saying, talking about the charity stream that's going on that I'm a part of, um, because it's a wonderful, wonderful cause that's going on. It's called Level for a Cause, and it's related to Diablo 3. And I know it's not a Civ thing, but it's a charity event for an organization called Take This. And they specialize in educating the gaming community on mental health issues such as anxiety and depression. And they also run the AFK rooms at large con gaming conventions like PAX and Blade. They do a wonderful, wonderful thing for the community out there for all games. And I really think everyone should be stepping up to support them. Yeah, it's a it's a, a great cause, and you know, definitely in the I mean, everywhere in the video game world, we we see people that are that are struggling with issues. I mean, I think everybody everybody can benefit from some therapy or some counseling at times. So it's it's definitely something that's very important. A great it's a great cause. Be a moderator for a week; you'll need it. I don't think people would mind if you mentioned it. Like, I mean, like uh, I know it's a civilization uh, cast, but honestly, like it's such a good cause. I also like to support it. I didn't get to see your uh, stream, but uh, if you're still streaming tomorrow, I'll go f check it for sure. Oh yeah, yeah, boy, it hits close to home because we, you know, we, especially the moderators. I'm not, I'm not a moderator. They, they see people that have some, some issues uh, on a daily basis. So they, that we, we, and we know how video games the world. There are people that have issues. So it's, it's, it, it. Anybody that plays video games or is on the internet a lot knows that it's an important issue. Well, for sure. And you can find all the links related to that in the description of the stream. I have a section for it. Okay. So and are they going to make the goal of the... of the? Uh, are you guys going to make the goal? I think we are. We're already well over $5,000, and it's only day two. The weekend hasn't even hit yet. And we're already all the way through. There. All the way through Sunday? It does. And there are 32 streamers participating in this event. From the big ones like Wolf Cryer, Riker... Bloodshed, all the way down to little ones like myself, and we're all working like, towards raising money like you for this said, cause. It, does, does it help the cause if somebody just watches? Just the just the hits is helping it, or I, I, I wasn't sure. Um, just watching it doesn't donate money, so to speak, but it does spread awareness of it, and that also helps out because when people look at streams, they see one with a whole lot of views on it, they naturally go to look at it because there are so many people watching it. Obviously, it's good. So it draws people in that way too. So even if you aren't putting money in it, you're still helping out just by watching. You're supporting the streamer by taking time out of your day to watch. Yeah, it's a great idea because you get to you're you're playing a game and you're raising money for charity and getting other people. And it's a, yeah, it's a great idea that I mean, I've seen other you know, it's other people done st similar stuff for other causes. But yeah, it's a great idea for video games to play a game while you're raising money for charity. I know, like many streamers, that sometimes do events like that. Like, I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of generally uh, like watching streamers, but uh, I've heard like uh, streamers sometimes raise up up to a thousand, two thousand dollars, but by themselves for to support one specific cause. So yeah. I think it's actually like a good path uh, Twitch is taking and I, all the streamers because it does bring the video game more in the community as well, or more in the internet community. Absolutely, and to uh, kind of end this topic and move ourselves along. I did want to say that the person who heads this up, his name is Wolfcryer. That's his account name. 
He has a YouTube and Twitch account. I have the links in the description as well. And this is the second level for a cause that he's run. I very, very happily got to be in touch with him in time to be a part, to be a streamer involved with this one. And it's been an absolute blast working with all these people. We have people in the European and Asian regions and in the United States. So it's been a huge undertaking. Yeah, and I mean, you love uh, Diablo 3, so it's like a great win-win, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, to bring this back to our Civ 6 side of the world, one of the hot topics lately, and we've been getting so many new players in the community, which is absolutely wonderful. It's always great to see fresh faces, some new blood lurking in the field. But a lot of people with these newer players are actually just that newer players. They don't have many hours in Civ 6. Or some of them bought it because they found out multiplayer is still a thing. And, but what challenges do these people go through transitioning from the couple games of single player to the multi -game, multiplayer side? I think yeah, I mean, Civ 6... Oh, you yeah, go, okay. yeah, sure. I go, go ahead. ahead. I think Civ 6 actually has a lot of potential uh, because it is a, by itself a genre almost of it's like very different from many other competitive games if you look at the multiplayer scene. And at the same time, as all the strategy aspects that you would expect from a multiplayer game. But I think it's also a very complicated game, a little bit like when you learn a like, board game that which has like 10,000 rules. So at first it looks very complicated and this is what I think uh, is the biggest challenge when you join a multiplayer community. Yeah, it's a complicated game, but it's not, it's not hard to pick up and just Play, but yeah, you, you have to just assume when you join a com very com a very competitive multiplayer league like this that you're going to lose at the beginning, and you don't. You, you know, you have if you have the right attitude, it's not a big deal. You just got to approach it like, well, I'm getting better and I'm learning, and so that's uh, yeah. You can't focus in on the individual game and go like, well, I'm getting killed, or you're just going to get too depressed. You got to look at the broad picture and like, well, okay, I'm getting better at the game. I'm meeting some people. I'll uh, make a few friends and. And yep. yeah, that, that's how you got to look at it. That's how I look at it. I think you're right, but uh, I think we should emphasize the fact that, like, even though it looks complicated, the game is really simple. The concepts all are like uh, very uh, instinctive. You like the battle, the, the fighting system, or just like the resource generation system is really similar to many other games, you know. And I think uh, if we keep uh, the community is actually doing really well, good job, I think, uh, trying to welcome new players in. But the fact that the Fear Access doesn't have its own uh, active platform like us to really bring the multiplayer or to value the multiplayer is a huge problem because uh, even though we do a good job, it's not Fear Access, it's not the company, we don't have the exposure they do to really bring uh, Civilization 6 to the light for many players. Yeah, but it's, it's like that. I mean, that's part of our mission on the podcast is to tell is to tell people that uh, you know the multi, there is a multiplayer community. We have these moderators to to kind of smooth out the the things that turn people off from multiplayer. People quitting, you know, people raging, flaming them, or all, with those are all things that we you know we take care of in the league. We suspend people, you know. Sometimes we even ban people if they're really toxic. And you know, the, those are I think the major obstacles to people. I know that in the past that's been an obstacle for me. You just get kind of get turned off you're playing a game and some guy's just being a real jerk and eventually you know if people just go i'll just play this single player you know it's not as fun but uh, if people i understand because I've, I've been there myself you get frustrated yeah and i th i think actually the community does a really good job that's what i said the the, the problem is just that like uh, the uh, civilization 6 is not uh, like if you want to play multiplayer you could go in a public game within the own within the game as it is but the problem with Civilization VI is the length of the game and like the problems related to multiplayer. Like we have all those tricks now in CPL to try to make this go smoother. But if you join a public game and two people disconnect, that suddenly you have a AIs in your game and like it doesn't take that long that by turn 50 or turn 60, you're the only uh, player left. And people have to be uh, creative. Like, like you and I, did something I think is pretty rare on here. We played a game and we just agreed upon that we'd play it for 15 minutes because that's all the time I had. And we said we'd call it on score. You know, we could be like and play it and like scream at each other and they're like, I gotta go, you gotta go, no, you're right. But we agreed ahead of time, you know, we 
solve that problem by saying, we'll just play, and the person with the higher score at 50 minutes is done, and that's, you know, that's, or I've had played some people, and we agree to come back and, you know, return to the game, which, you know, is easy to do with a duel. I realize with a free-for-all, it's, that's not going to probably happen. Yeah. Although we did, have, we did have a guy on here that wanted to know if we did play by mail or hot, hot uh, you know, a pit boss, and while they don't have it in the game yet, there is a site that I, I'm not going to mention it because I don't even know if it's any good, but I'm going to try it out. It's, apparently, it can do that for you. And so I think that would, it could be an, an additional thing that people could play. Like, you know, people play their games here, but they may have a friend in, you know, in Asia that they're never on at the same time, and they could play a play-by-mail or a pit boss game with them, and that's apparently what this website does. So I'm definitely going to try it out with this guy and see if it works. <coughs> and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll report back to the league. Excuse me. Yeah. Cut you off with a cough there. I came down. I know that's not generally met with kind of disdain from the league, like oh, play by mail, or like I think people have like a snobby look, like oh, why would anybody? Yeah. But I, I don't. I think that you got to have a bigger tent, and let. And I think you bring in casual players, and some of them will become hardcore. But if you just have the attitude like oh no, you don't belong here, then that we're never going to grow the league as much as we could. So I always are welcoming to any any person that wants to play multiplayer on any level. I'm not going to say like oh, you're not hardcore enough for this league or any of that nonsense. Yeah, of course like, not. Yeah. I think that's actually how the game was designed to be played as well. Like, if you just look at the solo play, a solo player, uh, it's rare that you actually sit for eight hours doing one solo player game. You save it and you come back to it later, you know? And a little bit like some people play chess sometimes from online, they, they give them, like, you have one new day to think about your move, and then you move the next day another move and everything. I guess it could be done with Civilization VI, but... Uh, it doesn't really bring the excitement of other games like, uh, you know, like Lo uh, League of Legends or StarCraft. And, or, and like uh, I say, it's on it's on us. There's only so many moderators and admins. It's on us as players to be welcoming to the players and not pick on them or take advantage of them and screw them over again. Because that's, you know, like I said, we're all ambassadors. And so when you when you do that, if somebody does that, you're you're maybe killing some player that might turn into like another great player, but maybe you scared them off. So I think that that's a good to point out. Like people... Oh. You can figure out who the new people are, and I think everybody could take a little extra time and just be a little extra nicer to that player at the beginning to welcome them instead of, you know, just getting in a fight with somebody like like why well, they don't know the rules or like people just need to be a little more understanding. So I'm going to throw a lot. two points with that, and uh, one is going to be is that the CPL is primarily a competitive league, and while we're we're, we're starting to open up more to all sorts of players. It's been a competitive league for 17 years, so it's really hard to, sh to break the bond, so to speak. It'll always be a competitive league, but it's people are so firmly rooted in it that it, it's, it's hard to change. But people need to be open to that on the flip side of the coin, because if there's never any change, things can't improve either. Yeah, because I never would say expect the league to change. I would just say, oh, you know, welcome in this side of it. It's ne I realize it's, it's always going to be a, like a side of the – a tiny side of it. But, yeah, I don't see why – what's the point of, of saying like, hey, you don't belong here. Like you're not well, – there, there's no good that comes of that. There's not – let the person play, mm -hmm. you know, try to find their games. What's I don't see any harm in that. It's not going to like tank the league or something or to have one or two people playing a play-by-mail game or – No, not at all. It's especially true because, like, uh, we do have to make the extra effort, effort to get people in, to keep people in the league. So if you just, like, uh, disregarding the fact that a new player comes in and they just say, oh, you don't know the rule, just, like, read that and, like, be a little bit, like, um, cold to this new player, then it doesn't, uh, in, like, really incite them to stay in the league. And plus, I know, I know from my personal experience, like, I know that people, there are people in this league that would, could play some of those type of more casual games on the side. Because, like, <laughs> yeah, I might I get more league, than a couple games a week. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because <laughs> or some people that they don't have time to do a five-hour game, so a play by mail with a you know with a c couple of dedicated friends it could be a nice just like an in addition to their regular play. Because I just know when I came in the league just a few months ago, hardly anybody did duels, but I just kept trying, and now you know now. We're doing this dual tournament that you're that you're organizing, and you said you know before you weren't even going to do it because nobody was dueling. So people have to just try to make the and and Blade is big on the teamers. He said the same thing. He he made an effort. So there's other and like Agathy and I did this time game. I th I think maybe somebody I see well, people doing games where they play against AIs now. Even 
you know, like a couple people against AI. So I, I always welcome different styles of play just to try it out. But I think uh, CPL actually, as uh, Sarnt was saying, it was a multiple, uh, a very competitive uh, community, if you should say. And I think many players join with the intention of playing competitively as well. So we need to like keep a direction. We need to keep what we, the basis ground we have and ha add to it w uh, other types of games if we want to expand it more as it is. Yeah, like All, All Fall Down came on and was like, hey, let's play Game of Thrones. Obviously, that's not going to be really a, a competitive, like serious. It's just for fun. And, but a bunch of the top players, I remember I saw going in there and playing it. So that, that's the example. I mean, it, it doesn't, you know, you can, every game you play doesn't have to be, you know, like that super serious. You can play one game every once in a while. That's like a Game of Thrones mod or, you know, yeah, like I a, mean, that's, it that's just what depends I mean. what you're looking for. And you have to be willing to spend a little time looking for it if it's, you know, something that's off the wall, so to speak, like playing with mods in the community or in our community specifically, I should say. Not many people do that, but it's slowly becoming a thing. And it's not really frequent, but people are actually talking about it now, whereas six, six, seven, eight months ago, you'd say, oh, yeah, well, I found this mod that's really cool. You wouldn't find anybody being ghost town. Yeah, Agathy tries. I've seen. I've played some of those short fifty-player uh, turn mods in Agathy. I saw was fifty I think player. Tried to play one today, right? The, the nuke one. Did you get it going today? You were trying Agathy. Uh, it. Well, it didn't work out today, but sometimes it does, and that's the whole point. Uh, like I played like uh, the religious one last week, and we played an ancient rivals as well, which is in the ancient era for fifty turns. Pretty fun. So I, sometimes it gets going, but I think those uh, mods. Uh, should be a selling point for Civilization VI, personally. Because the very long games for a multiplayer session are not really easily be easily done. And if you want to really grow the community further, you have to bring something much shorter to do and to like, actually have some sort of like incentive or competition in those mods. Yeah, that's like, just me. Yeah, yeah and like, I, th I think like I'd like, I think eventually you might even see people even as, as crazy as it sounds, I could see occasionally people even doing a free-for-all and coming back to it. Because you have dedicated – think about it, You have people that are so <laughs> hardcore. They'll sit there for hours, you know, when the game is like kind of at a standstill because oh, they want to win. I, you can't tell me that that person wouldn't be dedicated enough to say, hey, let's come back. We'll all agree to come back at, you know, this day, two days from now and just do it. If they're willing to sit there for four hours with two guys just – going back and forth going nowhere why wouldn't they be willing to come back you know and all come back they if they're that dedicated i i can't believe that somebody wouldn't occasionally instead of playing an eight hour game like, okay let's stop at five and come back you know a day or two from now and I, finish this i actually disagree with you uh like i'm not disagree about the the how involved they're in the game but as many games often when you start something you want to finish it you know and even if you don't finish, if you don't want to come back, if you want to come back to it, then you have to uh, arrange a, uh, actually a schedule with the other players and or come back all the same or, time. Or at least, it, you know, I agree it's having eight people, is good, but sometimes the game comes down to like a bunch of irrelevant people and maybe two or three people left. And maybe that's more realistic. You could say, okay, let's, let's not call this a CC. Let's the three of us come back with AIs that we agree not to, you know, attack or whatever the agreements they are, and we'll finish this game with the other guys are irrelevant. They're done. So and that, that that I could see. That's more. Re I could see that happening maybe. Well, it does happen. I mean, like I've been in a few games, and at the end of the game, like it's clear that it's, it's either that player or that player winning. And then often players want to quit. Like it's been like four or five hours, and they say like anyway, it's one of two that wins. So can we all quit and you two play it out? Like I've I've been in a few games like that, and I unfortunately lost them. But it's okay. Like that, the, I think the the rules are the, as they are actually really good because you can vote to be irrelevant. So if you do want to play FFF for a long game, then you can just quit and you still be in the league and you won't be actually yeah. a quitter. Or, or yeah, I, I agree. What I'm saying is, you know, it's, it's not, it's you know, that's not gonna happen. It's gonna be pretty rare. But I think what might be realistic is like you, because maybe you have a game where you say this game is gonna have a maximum of four hours, and if if it goes that far, we're gonna call on score. And you, and that might help, because some people, you know, we that's can't, happened they can't commit to like six hours. Recently, actually, where Wolf well, they do had, time. Uh, I don't want to say it was like two and a half hours, three hours to play. And they agree. They agree. And we all to... we all agreed. It was like me, him. I don't remember who else. It was a three v three v three. 
and fucking two and a half, three hours hit and said, you know what, it's just, we're done, you know. We all agreed two and a half, three hours, so. I mean, yeah, it was, it was so kind of frustrating because it was a really pivotal moment in the game that it could have gone in a lot of different ways. But at the same time, you know, you agreed to that coming into the game, so you can't really complain but about it. Is that something the host could do? Like, could I say host a game and say, this is my game and it's going to go for three hours, and if you want to play that game, you do. If you don't, you don't. Can I can I set a parameter like that? Yeah, you can. Yes, well. yeah. Yeah, so it's I'm just, gonna try to I'm gonna try to do that because I know like people when you if you, like a month ago if you said oh we're gonna do barb games people would just laugh at you and now you see it's pretty popular people are playing barb well, games and well the, barb games were really popular on the other server when they mer before we merged but it's not just that it's not just the old server people it's new people coming on and playing but before people said oh that'll never happen that was like it was laughed at like you don't play barbs that just it just the you barbs don't do that. were now, laughed at because when the Persia patch hit. Something was done with the coding that made the barbs, the barbs, the barbarian AI moves take up a lot more space than it should have. It was too much processing power for people. You'd have people that would normally not have lag until like turn 110 start lagging out at turn 50. And those are people with really good computers. But they, well, they fixed it apparently? Yeah, they that, fixed yeah. it with the, uh, the latest patch. <clears throat> And but also, I mean, there's I, there's a certain pure kind of player that just won't ever do it. They think it's too it's cheesy or it's too random. But I'm saying, but as soon as you gave people that option, it was it was I was surprised how many people are well. It's, are it's doing always been now. an option. Just people didn't know it was fixed because it was always voted no because everyone assumed it was still broken. But I mean, now that there's that room for it, it really seems to have made a difference in how many games are played with barbs. In fact, there's there's a room to join just for that. It seems to have made a big difference. I think so, and at Barb's, I think they actually balance the game, but uh, uh, the thing is, uh, it was always going by the majority before, and people, what they were playing, they, they liked to play just the FFA, Barb's off, and always the same civilizations, you know, so in that mindset, no, that's why Barb's were not that popular. And the new thing that we've been talking with in this, uh, the player panel, and I don't know, it may go out to a vote for the whole, is this uh, King of the Hill, which I thought sounds really interesting, where you play and only one person gets the win. Everybody else just gets one loss against the winner, and the winner gets, you know, whatever. If it's an eight person, they get seven, you know, wins, and so, it encourages you know, people to play to win and not do these like, okay, I'll agree to be second, you're third, or because they don't it's get already anything. on the game bot, isn't it? <laughs> Is it? I, I'm not sure. If it's been that I think it just got put in game bot today, if I'm not mistaken. So I definitely want to try again. Yeah, and the same thing, you're going to get a lot of pushback from people who say that's lame and this is it. But I, I just, well, I just want to play it and see. But I think there's a number of people that seem to be into trying it out at least one time. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, options should be there for the community, and if that's an option people want to have available to them, why not? Well, yeah, so my there. thing is I don't yeah, I don't try to I don't try to badger people. Now my thing is just like if I think there's some cool thing, I just now my thing is I just try it. I say, Hey, do you wanna play it? And then see I don't I'm not gonna try to you know, sit there and discuss it with somebody for hours convincing them. Like, Here, here's my game, you wanna join it? And that that's the only I think that's the way you get some changes. You you can't try to convince people by talking with them about it. Okay. And Agathy yeah. is right. I'm looking at Bob commands right now and it is there. Yeah, it got to put up today. They updated today. Just like the Defender of the Faith, people were that was just that was unthinkable that you would have that or Crusader. Now it's like it's happening all the time in games that people allow it. I think. But another thing with that is is back then, you there was a huge divide between the the really good people and the rest. Now the rest are pretty darn close to the coattails of. The better yeah, players. It's true. There's it's a really true. big blur there now. Actually, I quite like that because actually it's a good way to get new people in because now the level is more like, uh, well, first of all, there's a lot of players in CPL, and second of all, there's a lot of players of many levels. So if you get in one game, you're not guaranteed to lose. Like, they won't necessarily be that top player in it, like, uh, as we would be expecting in other times, you know. Yeah, and like I duels. Think... Yeah, like like your Agathy is better than me, and he actually does duels. So that I, I would say, like I don't know what exactly. Like you're not the level of like the very very top guys, but uh, because you do duels, I think there's guys that would beat you most of the time in a free for all that you could beat in a duel. 
which is well, so that's something to go, you know, that's something for players to think about. Like if I concentrate on this type of game, maybe I can beat the top guys in that game because I'm just doing this style of game. It's just some like incentive. Like, okay, I can never beat S death or Harambe in a free for all, but maybe if I play this style of game all the time, I could beat them in that. And I think I, that's well, it's a good motivation for like a mid level player or something. I think it can be, but I think the big selling point for Civilization Six is actually that like uh, people like to play a long game. You know, when they, you come in home and sit down, you're not expecting to finish a game in 20 minutes if you play Civilization Six. And the FFA uh, lobbies we have actually promote a long period of playing, and they have multiple like really good players, really good like streamers, which. Often they've seen, you know, like many uh, new players come in because they've seen the stream, I don't know, like uh, of SDEF or FO. Like I know like many of the French community in CPL came because of the French uh, uh, Twitch uh, streamers. And I think this is actually a good selling point rather than a duel because if you get in a duel and then you lose and you get another duel and then you lose, then suddenly you've got two losses. But if you do one single FFA, then you had a nice time for three hours. Maybe you lost, but at least you had some fighting potential because there was more players involved than just you. And but you'd actually people. get you could actually get a lot more losses though. if you play an eight person. You come in last. You're actually getting. Yeah, but it's not necessarily about the losses, losses you? you know. It's, like, you, it's like the. I don't aren't know. You like getting seven losses though when you come in last. You are, yeah, of course you are. But the thing is, at least you feel like you have a fighting chance, or you feel like you actually have a say on the diplomatic scene of the game. So, like, you're not uh, like if let's say you play with another player on duo, that player doesn't talk because sometimes there's many players who don't talk too much on the CPL, and then you just lose at turn 44. Isn't it like unmotivating if you come instead to a player FFA game? And you lose uh, because we call and score a turn 932. Then suddenly you had a Not long really. I, I look at it the other way. I look at it like if I play in an FFA, like I don't have control of so many things. I could play my best game and just get bad things and just get clobbered. Where at least in a duel, if I lose, I know you know it's because I didn't do this. And it's I well that, that RNG with the map design is going to haunt me no matter where you. Yeah, are. yeah, that's true. But I, I get it. I just it depends on your uh, who you are as a player because some players like to play with a lot of people. Some players like to play really like uh, a one-on-one -on -one thing. Like if you like look at games like Hearthstone, you know, it's like a one-to-one -one thing and it's very popular because it's a card game. You got like many things uh, involved. Like it's very really instinctive gameplay. And uh, Civilization Six do provide uh, some. Uh, I guess it can provide it, but it's not as. Uh, I, I and, would say, and like, as, like uh, evidence, you know, I'm doing a deliberate segue into starting the CPL Challenger series because the, the the map play style, the map in that series is a tiny map, and as you've seen, Argathy, that that does extend the game out a good bit. It's probably more like a two-hour game. I think on the, on the tiny map, it's a lot bigger, so it, you do have a little more time. I, I literally, I think it's a great choice for a, this Challenger series because you have a lot more time to build up, and it's not just immediate rush with a couple of horses and. Yeah, he's talking about the tournament that's coming on soon, right? Like the 1v1. Yeah, the, one, uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if this is the point where Sarnath wants to talk about because I know that was one of the topics, I think, right? It, it was, and it, the topics on the agenda post that gets posted and broadcasted out, that's not the order or anything that gets discussed. It's just, you know, things that are going to come up for sure. And it's not even everything we talk about. We always find new things to come up. But it's coming up soon. The sign up is the twenty fifth, right? That's when you can start. That is up correct. On November twenty fifth, it is a Saturday at eleven a.m. Eastern. It's the same time. Excuse me. That the tournament matches are going to start, which are on. Oh, sorry, pick up something. Is the ninth and tenth at the same time? So if you can't make the sign up, you probably can't make the match either. And it's eight eight people, and it's everybody can play. And I've you know I've heard some people complain about that. Why isn't it? The, but I understand you you want it to start to be open to everybody, and you have plans. You know, at some other tournaments where it will just be the top players. Or I know you have like this is just the beginning. You have a, a long term plan for this, is what I understand. Wow. I think it's a really good initiative to start as well. Like, and like now that we put the du uh, tournament for duels, people actually like are curious about 
what's a duel in Civilization Six as well, because it wasn't really mentioned very often, except by Louis, because Louis well. always said, plays duel, you know. Yeah. And I've talked to a few players, and like they were talking to me about duels, like, oh yeah, like maybe I should try one day, and like suddenly it became part of the community as well. Yeah, and yeah, one of the biggest got, things with uh, bringing this into a tournament fashion is everyone's like, oh my god, the spawns are so unbalanced, this isn't fair, that's not this. They won because they had an extra hill. Well, what if I told you I was creating all the maps that'll be used in the tournament, and they're all balanced starts, but you're not on top of each other, and there are no city-states, so no one can blame who had what city-state either. I, well, I didn't. I didn't even know that you were. Map. Yeah, I didn't know that you were creating all the maps. That's even better. I didn't. I, that's something new. I didn't know. So that that's cool. Well, I think people always complain anyway, you know. And civilization, because it's a random map generation, and people just assume that if they lose, it's because not because of their gameplay, but because of something else, you know. That's the first reflex you have. But. Uh, Regardless of that, like uh, if you have actually a tournament go going on, and if you like restrict the settings, like say, oh, it's always this the same way, then suddenly it becomes like a repetitive game, and it becomes something that people can rely on. So, this build order works because it's on that map, and you have those that many hills, you have that many science by that turn, you know, and people try to calculate a little yeah. bit. But yeah. because it's tiny, you you have time to uh, make up for something doesn't go right exactly you know you can't it's it's not very easily rushed on this side now. yeah sometimes you do sometimes you don't i mean i'm not i'm not going to sit here and lie to you all the all every single map in that pool is completely unique from every other map and the only thing that is going to feel fair to the players is that their starts were pretty darn close to uh balanced they're not know, they're not other... mirrored in any regard there is no mirror on that map I don't, I don't know about the other top players, but I know uh, I did ask S. Death, and he said he will play in it. So I don't know about other top players, but at least he did say he'll play in it. So that's good. Well, I think uh, having like, I, I'm quite surprised to hear there's like already made an script. Like I'm quite happy to hear about it, and I think it follows the same pattern of like other very competitive games. You know, like if you look at, let's say. Starcraft, you know, Starcraft, you have a, a map always the same or a map pool, as they say, and then you know that you will be playing on those balanced maps and that whichever position you spawn on, you'll still be able to have the same chances to, of winning than the other player. Yep, and um, a lot of people, a lot of the messages I've gotten, people were really angry because I'm only letting eight people join. The first eight who sign up will be playing. And the reason for that and as, as I've explained to people one-on-one -on -one as they've messaged me, is that I want to see... I haven't seen many duels. I've seen a handful of them, enough to at least start this type of tournament series. But I want to show the community that I'm a competent tournament director and that I'm taking this very seriously. And even though I have really big plans for this, I want to show that I can give this a very strong foundation to build off of. I think it's a, the best way to start tournaments in uh, civilization is actually to do it this way because it's a very easy in a way uh, approach. You get like you cannot do many make many mistakes, you know, like a one on one. There's one loser, one winner, and then it goes to the next round, and there's going to be one loser, one winner. And uh, in that sense, it gives a big structure, and also like really have the. Uh, also, like it values each win more than it does in FFA, because if you end up second, you get six wins and one loss, let's say. But in a tournament setting, then you're eliminated if you lose. So well, it's suddenly, gonna be, it's going to be a two out of three. But yeah, basically, what you're yeah, I, I see your point though. But, yeah, but it I is going to yeah. be two out of three. So like like let's say you win two matches and the other one lo loses two, then it means he is eliminated, and that player is better in, in the tournament setting. And at the end, the winner looks better because he actually won against the winners as well of the other things. And if, if we ever expand it and we get some winners from each tournament or if we get some series, like let's say like the best of those, like then we could make something like a little bigger and say, oh, this is a, like a professional tournament. This is like a 
They can restore the business and make any settings. Yeah, I just I just hope it gets more popular because it's a it's a really ready to focus it on. Like, because I, I I think it's hard to know exactly who I know. S Death is a top ranked player, but since he never plays, he just playing in games and often not even playing. These guys aren't often playing with top players in their games necessarily. So that at least something like this forces if the top players play, like they're going to go head to head, and you're going to see. Uh, that's going to really push them to play their best because right now, a lot, sadly, some of the times it's, you know, S death in one game killing people and then Harambe in another game pounding on people and, you know, animation beating up people in another game. And so you don't even, sadly, I don't, I mean, you don't see the top players maybe in the same games that often, always. And well, that's, I mean, me, that's kind of sad. That's the nature of free for alls. People are going to pounce on players that have like, military players. But I'm just yeah. saying they're not even in the same games often, I think, yeah, right? Yeah, but I get your point. But I think having, like, uh, uh, tournaments like this will actually give more exposure to the multiplayer scene. Which, if I, f I come back again to the other topic, but, like, if you have actually a duo, like, let's say those two are considered very good players and they play against each other, then suddenly people are interested. They want to see, they want to watch. Because they know that, like, both players are very good and at a very advanced level of, of play what they would do. So then people, like, like if you look at many people in civilization, they want to improve their gameplay, yet they don't want to, like, spend a whole time watching an FFA or watching a whole stream of four yeah, hours. Yeah, it's a longer to game, too. And also, you can't necessarily, like, say Harambe and Estet and Animation in a game, and they may not even spawn near, near each other. And so it may just be who is better at pounding on the mid-level players that you don't even see them, like, having to go at each other until maybe later in the game. And so well, this with a duel, right away you're seeing them go right at it. And so you really, it yeah. really can push them to the, all their best moves. It is true, but the thing is, uh, there's a, still a basic uh, meta game, and if you follow, if you understand a meta game and follow a meta game, then suddenly you're going to uh, raise your level up a lot. So in the duels, this will be even more obvious than it is in the FFA, because in FFA, if you look at one person. Like, you know, like doing the regular, getting horses, getting a few campuses out, and just like surviving, it'll probably be at least four or fifth within the eight players. And it didn't show any uh, skill, if you want to say, as or any competitive uh, to his gameplay, as we would expect. Yeah, they the still team. should. I mean, Animation actually is one of the top players that plays more duels. So in that sense, he would have a, an advantage in that, right? Because he does play more. But, I mean, I think if you have him and, like, Harambe and Estet, that they still should be the top three guys, whether Harambe and Estet play any duels, just because they know the game so well. that it, it, like I, That's not going to be nearly enough for me to challenge them at this point. I agree with you there, because in the Civ Players League, we had a player called Grimstrip, and he was not very good at free-for-alls. But in duels, he was king. He trounced everybody in duels. There was no one in the league he could not be. Did he ever try to play free-for-alls later, or he just stuck with duels mostly? No, he did play in free-for-alls. He, he would get smacked around like crazy. In free-for-alls, the thing is, sometimes players know each other. Like, the community, like, there's many regulars that come over, and you're like, oh, okay, as death is in this game, or, like, automation is in this game. I have to play differently with him because I know he knows the game and because I, maybe I have to try to talk to my neighbor to like time uh, an attack on him to, and when he's like the weakest. So then maybe we have a ch shot of winning. Yep. And you yeah, get so, that. Yeah, a duel, is, yeah. a duel is more like a pure chess game. Like if you have a mastery of yeah. the game and you do the right moves, you should be able to win. You don't have to balance out like, okay, does animation tend to attack me earlier? Does S death tend to rush? Do I know? What to, is he going to get really upset and team on me? You, those are not, yeah, you don't have to deal with those factors. So it's different. Yeah, it's, I agree. It's a different, I mean, I have a better, much better chance of, I, I, I even declared today that I would beat S death in a duel someday and he immediately dismissed me. I, I still, I still, I try, I try to make bold. Just to challenge we need to buy another thing in diapers. I bought a smaller well, one. I think a duels is a good way to start, and eventually we could even add some other mods to it. So, I bought a smaller thing in uh, diapers because I, I know, like the, 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 the game was launched. 
uh, Firaxis tried to promote their ancient rivals in a podcast as well, really similar to this, and it didn't really took off. But there's a quite a few fifty turns mode that are yeah, they're quite designed. I mean, they're yeah, they're designed specifically <laughs> yeah, for, for more to for, and the online speed was designed specifically to make the games go yeah. faster. Designed for online speed for multiplayer and last sixty to ninety minutes roughly, depending on how you put the turn timer. So, so you've played one of them, right? You've played one of the nuclear ones, or you've played one of them. I've played a few of them, and I think they're really fun. You have played at least one or two of them before? Yeah, I've played, I've played quite a few, and like for, to me, those are the most fun games, because like you have a beginning and an end. I'm a big fan of uh, playing until you meet the victory condition, you know? And, and that like, rarely happens, right? In a in a free for all, rarely somebody actually gets the like people. I think a few people get the victory screen and they have never seen it before. Like, what is that? Yeah, <laughs> it's like, true. What, what is that? Games, screen? When <laughs> players that like, screen? why why is the game paused? And like, <laughs> oh, is somebody that? won. Like, yeah, know, what is that? Why why is there a like a big garden and everything? What's going on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, that's the, that's the thing. But I, I think uh, that's what uh, Civilization 6 lack in multiplayer. But at the same time, we can't blame it because the game is so long, the regular FFA. And even in duos, technically, it could last like hours. It, like if you're like very toe-to-toe, -to -toe, it could go to a space. It could go to as a culture victory. Like it's, it's still doable. It's just because like often there's one player better than the other and he'll take advantage and win. It's, I think it's rare because it is... The way, in my experience, especially on a dual map, somebody gets a little bit ahead and it just becomes like a seesaw and just bam. It's just like mo mo most of my duels end like 30 minutes less or... Yeah, well, you have to yeah. anticipate further. That's why. But yeah, I get your point. Duels, are there's less chances because the map is smaller. But on FFA, if it would be played until the end, there's more chances to reach the victory condition because the map is much larger. But the so tiny really you... changes, yeah, the tiny really makes it a lot more strategies and it, it changes the dynamic a lot because it, it's that it's not this horse rush dynamic, I think is not as big because you're so far away, you got more time to build up and get up some walls up or build, you know, more guys and have them fortified. And in a dual map, it's just right there's horses on you and like, what the, what, it's like turn 20 and there's like three horses yeah, at me and like, okay. It's yeah. Hi. I also think like I'm doing it like a link with the challenges that like or the maybe what the clans do to help the community because I know some clans try to it used to try to make some duels I know some clans also try to make like uh, games to incorporate new players in and I think uh, clans should also like uh, introduce what the multiplayer scene is because right now they're introducing the game concepts like uh like production is pretty good in that city. Like if you build like a mine there, then you'll have like more truce and more everything. But like those concepts can be easily learned in single player. And, and I think speaking have... of the of the clans, we have a new clan, the Felix Culpa Gaming. That's a brand. So I'm I willing to welcome them to the uh, to the CPL. That's a brand new uh, clan. Yep. Yeah, I think it's a. I am actually quite happy to see because before there was like two or three major clans that like. Was all, it's always always the same people in the same clans, and if there would be an event like last, I don't remember when, but last event like was in summer. It was the CCC, uh, and uh, the CCC. We had uh, five clans come. I guess technically oh, five, okay. four, since Team Liquid uh, got their plug pulled because MGT made a real big fool of himself, and uh, Team Liquid told him to get lost, and he was not supposed to be doing stuff. Okay. But well, we, uh, I'm quite happy. Sorry, go ahead. I'm quite happy to see there's more clans because now there's going to be actually more uh, exposure and more competition as well. So it's not going to be like the two top clans fighting each other. Like uh, because like I, for a long time I've saw that there was like like Team OP and Team KC which had many players, and those are were the only players I was usually seeing on the. Well, Sun Z is. I think. I think the. I probably, saw, oh yeah, Sun even Z though well. I'm in in Sun Z, I think I would. I'm, I'm not sure because now that we have S Death and uh, Harambe in the in the Sun Z, we're maybe we're bet we might be better than OP, but I don't, I don't know. OP won well, the last tournament, but uh, Sun Z won the CCC, so it, it's kind of the wash on that. It's hard to say, and the situation is going to keep changing over time because you know Felix Cooper Gaming coming into the CCC. Damage Incorporated is coming back to the next CCC. 
Um, we might have some other communities that have been popping up now that they've been hearing more and more about our events. They may part set teams to participate. So we could easily have upwards of five to seven clans showing. Which is a good thing, because suddenly there is actually a competitive scene. Like if you say like, oh, those clans, they compete against each other. Then one clan wins, there's actually a tournament, there's like a prize, there's a winner. There's a face for the Civilization Six, not just like uh, just regular streamers streaming on Twitch. Oh, that's what I think. Yeah, I was I was brand new in the league when I I just was happy to participate in the you know and I was I was like a sub in the one of the four before, but I was just happy to like help out you know any way I could. So that that was really nice. So I like being in I really like being in Sun Z. A lot of cool guys, cool guys and ladies in there. Well, so going back to uh, new players transitioning to multiplayer, let's talk about the first forty turns. The first 40 turns are the most important in the game. And there's a yeah. lot of reasons for it, and I'd like to discuss why. Well, I think, even though the game has many concepts, many strategies, many resources, there's a few build orders that are generally always good. And, uh, like, if you, like, and see many in multiplayer, especially, even though it's true even in single player, but in multiplayer, you see many people going scout and scout to scout the map f f faster and to find city states, to find huts, and to actually have a rough idea of what's around them, you know. And yeah, then... it is very dependent on that. I mean, most free-for-all games do have at least city states in them, so I, th I think that's kind of standard that you do have the two scouts so you can get a first meet on the city states or get a few goodie huts. Yeah, that's pretty standard. And then and I guess you build a settler. The third thing is generally a settler, but I don't think that's universal. But I guess that tends to be the third thing. And I then think a builder. It tends as well. Uh, but the thing is, every the map will dictate what should be the optimal build order. But what you have to rem rem remember is that you want to grow your empire as quick as possible and grab as much land as possible early on. But you also have to survive. So if you do it too much, if you do too many settlers, or too many workers, then if your neighbor shows up with a few horses, suddenly, like, you might just lose all your efforts. But it definitely encouraged you, like, I know in Civ 4, there was a mechanic to discourage too many cities. You started getting corruption if you were too far away from your... Yeah, and Civ, Civ 5 was very, the vanilla was very punitive. It became where all the top players just built, like, three or four cities, and then that, that was not good. And the Civ 6, I think it's encouraged you to, to build lots of cities and always be expanding. It, the, 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 it does, the, it does. The hindrance is that you run into other players, not that the game starts penalizing you for adding too many cities. Well, I think even though, like, this is true, and you can get much larger, people, like, overvalue the largeness of their empire. Often, the best way to grow your empire at one point will be to conquer your neighbor rather than to found a new city, because the settlers still, like, increase in cost as the game progresses. <laughs> Like the builders also uh, increase in cost, and the districts will increase in cost as well. So conquering a city becomes much more valuable than actually like town. Yep. Yeah. So I, in that sense, uh, early on you do want to grab the land you absolutely need to first to survive at least at least three or four cities to be able to actually claim your area. And then from there, you have to choose if you can grow with your neighbor. You can go military. We can put the, there's a card for 50% production for horses or other units. If you want to conquer your neighbor, you probably want to run that card in your government. And if you yeah, it's all it's three. It's all three things that are important. You have to look at the best production. You have to know what time, when the timing is to try to take the city state out. Or raise yeah. it, or when the time, which what you know, what the timing is on your policy cards and your and your science. It all has to tie in together to your overall strategy. There's a really it high does, skill but... ceiling to the game, and a lot of people don't respect that, and that's what they fall victim to. I think the most important thing, though, is that you actually have to modify your strategy uh, according to the other players or AI strategy if you're playing single player. But in multiplayer, often, you can guess if you're able to conquer your neighbor or not. If but I think, not what, him. Yeah, I think what Sarnath is 
saying it, what it it's it's so important because if you if you get a bad start it doesn't matter how good you are you can't dig yourself out of it if the other guy's coming at you with seven horses and you have two because you didn't expand your cities that that sets the whole if you do that wrong yeah. that you, the rest of the game is going to be frustrating for you oh yeah that is for sure that is for sure but i believe that even though there's some starts that are very bad that will lose you the game even before you start playing, that most starts you can still work around it. You just have to be a little more creative sometimes. So like, no, not uh, not bad starting positions, but you yourself doing a bad start yeah. for the first. You can't recover from that. If you do, like, you sit there and say, "I'm just going to build up this one city and and build like four, uh, you know, four uh, wonders and see how that that you're going to get spectacularly beaten and it's, it's going to be yeah. ugly." I think it's, it's especially true because you have to be very aware of what the players are doing around you. Knowledge so is power. Why... It's very military oriented. I think people sometimes people don't understand that. Even I struggle with that. Like I tend to be more onto simming, and I some, a lot of times don't build enough military. That that's yeah. That you have to survive. And I think it's the, the production is king, right? It's more important to produce than it is to have like tons of food. It seems early on. Uh, it is true. But then the latest patch actually changed a little bit the, the thing about that. But it's still true. The production is still the best resource, and the biggest army will generally win the game if it's played properly. But uh, the thing is, uh, early on, you do want to have an army to defend yourself, but if you cannot conquer your neighbor, then it's not worth it to necessarily build an army very big, very fast. Sometimes there's other cards, like the 50% settler production card, which is quite easily rushed if you're in a multiplayer. Uh, you can get a few setters out, settle the cities, get a few warriors, maybe slingers and archers, and still be able to stand your ground. So it and really then, depends on how you play. Also, it's important people, I think, like Sarnas was saying this, like you got to have like middle goals. You said you used to lose all the time, and then suddenly you started coming like in third and fourth and second in the FFAs. It just is kind of like a, it just starts hitting you all of a sudden, and suddenly you don't lose it. You don't you, come in you last. You have to be willing to put in the effort. And no, I didn't spend like hours going over games I had played over save buys. I didn't have to do that. It's just going back and learning the core fundamentals of the game. And that is what these training events, these plans are doing, are teaching these players. It's giving them the fundamentals to build on rather than focusing on build orders. It's making the most of the tiles you're given. This way you can build off of and spring forward. Because if you don't have those fundamentals, you end up severely lacking yeah, in production it's, and growth it's, and culture. It's just little and people re realize it should be. It's a little different, especially with all these new people coming in. You coming in as a new person, thinking, "Oh, I'm just going to get slaughtered all the time." You you got to realize that, and maybe in a few weeks, suddenly you're not like the super noob anymore. Now you're building up just enough where S Death looks at you and goes, "Okay, I'm going to crush this other guy who has no no army," and you have a little army, and now, now suddenly you last a little longer. Just those little things, and now you're coming in fifth instead of seventh, and you're actually getting to play for an hour and a half instead of 35 minutes. And just those little... Just being the, not the biggest noob in the game will keep you alive maybe another, you know, hour. <laughs> well, it's true. But I think many people that come in also have a, often a basic understanding of the game. Like, many people have played single-player, and know that like, oh, this, if you compare it with this, actually a good combination, you know, this general like boost this unit so strong. And like, if you take this campus and a plus five campus spot, then there you go, you have more science. You know? the it's players, not like, like smell, they smell blood though. So they know you just, you being just like, I, I think that's a good way for you new players to look at it. Just be, be the, be the dog that is just running faster than the other dog. And the other dog gets eaten before you think of that analogy. Just be, you know, you're not going to yeah. win, but at least, be the guy that FDS kills second instead of first. <laughs> yeah. So because you got to have little goals, yeah, you got to focus on little goals. You can't be like, oh, but, I'm going to lose again, and oh, okay, I'm just getting depressed. And there's FDS with nine horses again. Oh, here we go again. Like, no, you got to have little goals. Like, at least I lost second. Or, I, that's my thing. I've never come in last in an FFA. And not that I played that many, but that's my that's my pride that I've never come in. I've come in six, like, but never exactly last. But I think maybe we could still give a few like uh, tips if you want for new players what you should do in your first 40 turns because like, we're talking about like oh just build military just like not be 
a little better than the other guy next to you. It works at m most games, but if you actually want to get competitive, you actually need to get a few, uh, I guess, I have a patterns. Tip. I have a tip that was endorsed by F Death. The guy on the, in the text said, here's the strategy against F Death. Friend F Death and build two horses. And he said, yep, that's what you should do. <laughs> I mean, I as, guess I don't know. as a player, like I myself, I focus more on defensive warfare than aggressive. Although I've changed that a lot recently, but in the early game, if you're looking and you don't have two horses, or you you have a horse but it's really far away, just tech get animal husbandry, get archery to where it's like a turn off. You can finish it whenever you want, and just make a stupid amount of slingers. Mm -hmm. And then Often when your works. neighbor shows up with a bunch of horses, well, all of a sudden you have like 10, 15 archers. Those horses, unless there's 20 plus of them, are all going to die. Because that's the advantage of having tiles. Uh, like, it's not like in Civ 4, like, where you could have like 10 military units in one tile. In oh, Civ the six, death ball. Yeah, even in Civ 6, even if he shows up with 20 horses, he could only potentially attack your city with six tiles. And often, like, it's two or three in the game because you have military units in place. So he cannot take your city that quick. And if, even if he tries to do so, he'll probably lose many units. And so plus it's the not flanking, yeah, they, they, I don't think that was in Civ 4. There's like flanking and, and uh, like... Yeah, well, that's pretty more cool. Yeah. It's more like militarily hardcore. Yeah. Yeah, but you have to actually and, get a Civic in order to get those bonuses, so... Yeah. But uh, I really think that early game... Like you get a few units at, and then you position them properly. Like, let's say like you're uh, settling a city quite close to another empire. Well, put your units there. And then on the other cities, you could still try to grow. Like I like, I'm a so defensive player. I like to get a few builders out early and uh, rush a fourth city if I can, if I'm not uh, uh, under immediate threat. If you look at the scoreboard, you can look at the military score and have a really good idea of what the opponent is doing, you know. And if you're like 30 points behind, you could probably hold him off even if he comes to attack you. So, or you can you can try to rush uh, religion and get defender of the faith, and it and that that'll keep, that'll be a deterrent to try to attack you because that plus 10, you know, with with all your units. That, that if it's not banned, you... it's a very good strategy. Mm -hmm. okay, this and uh and and i think actually like uh, the new religion like addition in the last patch actually uh, benefit many uh, civilizations that are not that popular in the civilization six uh well meta right now because many civilizations that do not have significant bonus towards military early are often considered low tier civilizations that like have trouble competing with others like Russia. They, was Russia considered a good no. ship before this religious? Yes, yes. yes. Cossacks yes, are broken. Is. Like, yeah. the ability but, uh, to Russia's move after exception. attacking is ridiculous. Yeah. So now but they're like, even more OP then? Because now you can build that. Oh, yeah. You can get the religion first because of the cheap larvas, right? I think now, if we allow uh, those new uh, religion beliefs, Russia should be a ban. Like, uh, a little bit like Scythia. Like really, like uh, it is. They are. Back. Those are banned. Those two are banned in the uh, in the Challenger series, along with uh, Germany, Australia, yeah. and uh, Gilgamesh. Yeah. Samaria. So, I, I actually absolutely agree with that decision because Russia has very a lot of power. But let's say Russia is banned, and you have like uh, those religious beliefs open. Now suddenly you can have. Uh, Japan go religion and do really well. We could have Khmer go religion and do insanely and Kim, well. Yeah, like nobody builds a, a, a what, what's the uh, aqueducts, right? But if you're Khmer, you really want to build them. So that's like a, a like a building that suddenly come in to like be important. Like it really, they really get nice bonuses for for Khmer. But I, I think really nobody like... was building aqueducts before. But with Khmer, you you really should build them. Well, I really tested a lot of things, and I am a very, like, uh, mathematic in a way kind of player. I think a lot about my gameplay. And Khmer, I think, if played properly, can actually be more competitive than other civilizations, such as uh, the ones that we always see, such as, like, Greece, or such as, uh, uh, what's the other popular ones in Rome? Rome was yeah. popular Because well. that, that farm bonus too, right? If you put the farms next to each other, you get the other bonuses too? Yes, there is. But the thing about Khmer is that, like, uh, it's one of the civilizations, I believe, that brings a new uh, playing tall strategy to, to Civ 6. A little bit like Civ 5. 
There's a few, there's the new one there, Angkor Wat, that came out as well. And there's a few beliefs that now pair with other religion, uh, Pantheon, like the one that gives like uh, one faith for each uh, appealing tile, like if charming. Oh yeah, I think, I think is that India yeah. that yeah. gets that big bonus? So they and they get like a bonus for if they're on the coast, they get a faith for it. Yeah, Indonesia gets that bonus, but it's also Pantheon. Uh, like even if there's only Indonesia in the game, you could choose that pantheon to just one get, you know, you Also, if it's like a you get like a plus four, and because you're if you're if I you're on the coast, with the AD, you, those tend to be like high high like uh, benefit tiles anyway, right? They're they're high appealing by nature. Yes, but even if it's not on the coast, like sometimes like near a mountain, and it, it off, it's quite easy to get nice appealing tiles. At least a few of them and get a big. And also, she faith. gets uh, she gets uh, she can build a. Boats with faith, which is re that could really become in handy. So let's, I honestly let's think talk about if we're talking about Indonesia, there's so much more to talk about. Uh, just buying boats with faith because there's so many more bonuses that like people already disregard. Or like, like the culture, like, yeah, people don't really like that triple that thing with a triple culture on a, on a, a relic or something. If you if you if your uh, apostles die, tourism, so you, yeah, yeah, so you can let your apostles either the guy's gonna let you convert them or he has to kill them and you get triple tourism. So you could sort of do a combination culture religion. Now, hold you know, on now for. before you get too excited about that. Blade learned a rough lesson in that too. If it's not killed through theological combat, you yeah. are not getting diddly squats. So I can okay. burn your heretics yeah. all I want with my military yeah. units. You ain't getting squat. And I might just add as well that like there's two types of tourism. There's religious tourism, which is the relic, and there's regular tourism. And the religious tourism gets huge uh, decrease in the, during the game because like some technologies are reduced there. They're Printing. by fifty percent their like uh, effectiveness. So Printing the, uh, cuts in the tab, and everyone goes it because of the cab meta. Yeah. So like really like if you're going religion, uh, if you're going tourism, religion can help you, but it. it won't do it all by itself. You will. You that won't. Does, win. That just reminds. Does, does everybody? Do, do people think that the the uh, the counter to the calves early on is not is not uh, is underpowered, or am I doing it wrong, or they just they should be more powerful? No, cavalry are too good for their era, or let's say they are where they should be for their era. The problem is, is the anti-cavalry unit line has a huge stop gap between it between pikemen yeah. and AT crews. There should be a unit there in between that is intended to deal with the cavalry. But there isn't, so we're forced to go musketmen and the field cannons if you're not getting cavalry yourself. So the spearman yes. is not as... The spearman, if it was a, a legitimate counter unit, should be able to take down a horse, right? But it doesn't. It can if someone's going to bash your spear with a horse over and over again. But no one's going to do that. They're just going to walk around it because... Light cavalry, for some reason in Thraxus's mind, are immune to zone of control. No, I don't really, the, you have to take everything in consideration. Like the meta is to get cavalry, and well, to get like horses, and then upgrade them to cavalry eventually. And maybe some people add uh, heavy cavalry, like some like. Knights, knights to tanks. tanks. Yeah. So, what is the so, strategy if, if you know the guy's rushing horses and you wanted to be defending? What is the strategy to do in general? Swords and archers. Well, well swords yeah, and archers. swords and archers. But there's two strategies. It's either you go for a cab yourself and have something you can fight with, and, and if you overcome him with cab, you maybe you win the war, or you stay defensive, like a uh, scientist was saying. And if you stay defensive, sometimes it allows you to try to tech further ahead. But then, if that person actually managed to kill another player in an FFA, for example, suddenly uh, his investment of cavalry just paid off. So, so if, you if, you manage, have the, if you have Defender of the Faith and Swords, you're going to be able to hold yeah, off a cav rush? You will. You will. Well, you will for sure. You'll hold but, forces, but. You're not gonna hold. The only re the only way you're gonna hold cavalry if you're not using cavalry, are with musketmen and field cannons. Fortified musketmen will hold against cavalry. You're gonna be losing. You're gonna be slowly losing that front line, until your crossbowmen get promoted into field cannons. But the minute you have field cannons behind those muskets, those cavalry are going to get shredded. 
Except against Russia, but then that's the. Their that's region. only if. That's only really if you're near their territory when they get their plus five and fighting near the home yeah. But uh, I think like the whole way to like, overcome a very mil militaristic player is to hold your ground and hold that either the other players act upon him or you actually uh, out tech him and right? get a different tech path, a different strategy. Because if you cannot like mass forces as as good as he does, then suddenly you won't beat him. <laughs> so, like, let's say, like, you fighting against uh, Brazil, he got, like, a scaffold very fast because he had, like, a really good uh, agency bonus for his campus. Then suddenly, all your best hope is to hold ground with muskets and, like, Phil Cannons is starting to a thing. And you try to get maybe uh, a few, like, uh, culture or extra campus districts or maybe even fate districts in some cases to gain extra production to like really overcome him and like play for the late game yeah because later in the game yeah later in the game i don't know if everybody realizes you, you start getting enough faith you can really buy a lot of units really fast with, yeah, with okay. theocracy sure but... uh, the thing is faith the best way to compare it to the rest of the game is uh two fate equals one production roughly <laughs> That's my, my views on it. There's a few strategies that come with faith. Like if you go theocracy, it can be very good. But then like uh, maybe you buy a few units with theocr with faith, or if you have like a lavellet uh, city state, you can buy buildings such as walls that might help you. Yeah, because hold if you on get your if you put your holy site near a near some forest and mountains and a, and a natural wonder, sometimes you can get like a plus six or a plus seven. There's even one. On the map where you can get a plus nine on that on that built-in snowflake map, I think, or or the other, and so you, and then when you double that, when you get the double, and then you get the fifty percent, you can really get some, and then you build the extra buildings on top. You can really get like thirty over thirty faith for the holy side. Then you can really start getting some serious, you know, some serious faith going. You're right, and like I, I'm actually a very big fate player, and like I play competitively with fate. I play with S Death, and he doesn't kill me because I have fate in my empire, and I buy like those Garde Imperial from France, and like. I but buy, most like, people don't do that, right? Like, like you're, you're not typical, people, right? I'm, I'm very atypical player in that kind of sense. I'm very like I have very weird strategies sometimes, but they work. That's what it makes it fun. But they're not always as efficient as other strategies like that with the regular meta. But let's, it's true that you can get a huge amount of faith. Uh, like, just sometimes you get a Tundra uh, plus one agency for, like, your... Uh, so if you put, like, a, a Holy Fate, Holy Side District in the middle of the Tundra, you could get easily plus six, at least, faith from this one Holy District. And it doesn't take your campus spot. Because like generally, that. like... You want to put the campus next to the mountains to get some science out, you know. And like with a FFA, you could really, if if you could get people, I think the only way you have to get people to help to take your religion willingly, figuring that you that you'll never get the religious victory, and then you could really, there's that yeah. one where it's plus two the, for every city that you get. What if you got like twenty or thirty? You could really start getting some serious snowballing in a large if people were willing to take your religion. Yeah, but this that won't you'll happen. Never, thinking you'll never, no, people might think, oh, he'll never get the. Now, like uh, Louis, there's many things you have to understand. Like faith, I love it, but if you invest in faith early, then there's something else you're not investing on. You know, like we're going back to the 40 turns. Like, if you get the first religion, which only takes 30 points, I think, for the great prophet, the very first one, suddenly it's not too bad because like your faith district actually gives you a, a religion, and you can actually get uh, very quickly a bonus out of it and manage to have a decent amount of faith. But most of the time, this faith will replace either a campus or a commercial district or sometimes industrial platforms. And you really have to balance everything out. I just, I just mean if a, if a player thinks that you have no chance of winning by faith, there, there's there's every incentive for them to take your religion and get some benefit from it, right? It is true. Actually, I won last week a game against Red Phoenix with religion. Because he thought I couldn't do faith, like if yeah. So he took it because he got a benefit from it. Figured you'd never get it. So what's the, what's the, what's the, and by the time he figured out that you could do it, it was too late to stop you, right? No, he, he never wanted to take it, but he friended me. But you can sign a friendship in game for thirty turns. And I had a thirty turn window to convert him, my religion, because of it. 
So there's a re- and he had no religion, so he couldn't could not fight on religious combat because he had no religion. So I and he never, that. yeah, he never, and he never knew much about faith, even though he's like a you know one of the legendary players. He doesn't know much about faith, so that that was like your edge against him. Right? No, he did. He does know a lot about faith, though. I mean, now that's he the does, thing. But that's... I'm saying maybe at that game he didn't know as much, or really? I knew about it, just couldn't know anything about it. Cause it the, the core concept of this that's failing to be registered is that most competent players. The minute they see a missionary, they're going to tell you, you're either turning that around or we're going to war. Yes, it's true. And, but the thing is, in multiplayer, sometimes if you play a diplomacy game, you can argue like, oh, you let me convert you, so you and I don't attack or something. You can maybe do some stuff like this. But I think like when you play religion in multiplayer, the goal shouldn't be to win religiously because there's a... Okay, yeah, maybe we're too far from the original topic. Yeah. So why was that? Why was it the old way of somebody gets so pissed off when they see a missionary if they if they didn't think you were going to win? Why did they care so much? I, I'm I'm confused about that. Well, it's it's easy. It doesn't cost you anything to kill a missionary. But what? But you said, but Sarnas said in the old in the older days, people just immediately would say, "No, you're I'm going to declare war on you." Why, why were they so? I'm one of them. Why were they? So, and I'm a passive so, player in the league. But why? Why? What's the what's what's the downside? You want to win. You don't want to lose. And because if, if you don't think I have any chance of winning religiously, then what what benefit does it take you to not take my religion? If you take it, you get some benefit out of it, right? Well, sometimes, sometimes like the game, just like the be- the benefit you get from it are very minor. You know, like even if you're playing against religions like India, India gets. Uh, benefit from other religions that they, that spread into your cities. But most of the time, they're not good for you. Like, if you take, like, a, this temple building, or this, like, cathedral building, you don't have any faith in your empire, you cannot build any. And okay, like, so the other guy is just thinking, like, why am I going to take this faith that's going to do nothing for me? Or why am I going to help him out? So screw him, I'm going to go to war. It's like that, you mean? Yeah, so, like, I mean, you lose nothing by preventing him this faith victory. So in that sense, it doesn't like you'd really like if you play against other players, you're trying to win, right? So then, if he's trying to convert you, he's getting closer to a victory condition. So there's no, so it's really stop him. So but, you, get, yeah, you guys sneak it in when you when you're friends with somebody, maybe. Yeah, like that's the only way to do. That's the only way to do. But even yep. if you do that in FFA, it's often it's too big to even run across the map to convert everybody. But I think though. Uh, about the religion, there's a really good things that came out of the new patch that we should mention, like uh, because there's now the Khmer as I, uh, they get a housing bonus from uh, Holy Fight District, Holy Side Districts, and this housing bonus is actually enough to skip buildings like the Granaries sometimes, and I think there's many strategies like this that are very original that like uh, people don't really uh, play around and don't try it too much. I have some uh, potential in the higher level of play for uh, Civilization Six, or if you take other like strategies like uh, Indonesia, they have uh, a lot of faith output early on, and if you take a few beliefs that like if you have Valletta next to you, you can suddenly build your whole uh, city. You can build like granaries, monuments. You can build walls solely with faith. So in that case, it's like extra faith for your production. Well, if we're going to talk about Khmer and all these sites, you can't mention them without talking about the culture bomb. They culture oh, yeah, bomb the culture nearby bomb. tiles whenever they pop a holy site. In the site. So that promotes it even further. And it's really awesome think to see, that, especially when it's another player, that you take their three or four tiles away from that. That's an extra little, like, <laughs> other player, like, I just stole three of your tiles. <laughs> yeah, it feels good. Huh? But <laughs> it does I feel think, good. I think what's the best w- thing about it is like it d- does expand your uh, territory. It does allow you to work better tiles, maybe, or different tiles. And the housing bonus actually allows you to work those extra tiles. Like, because like if you grow your city too fast, often you still have only three or four maybe citizens you can work on, but that housing uh, really helps you. And there's a, even a belief that if you build a holy site by a river, you can get an extra housing out of it. And there's like a farm bonus too with the Khmer? And it, I, if you decide to play with the aqueducts in Khmer, they give three faith. And everybody like forgets about that. But isn't there extra food for every farm you yeah. put next to an aqueduct so, too? Yeah. 
There's one and an amenity, isn't it? Farm. Oh, and, yeah. an, and an extra amenity for your city, yeah. yeah. Which that's plus one amenity and plus one food per farm next to the aqueduct. And if you're farming next to two aqueducts somehow, it's plus two food. So in that sense, you can grow cities really fast, really big. And especially with a spawn dog, it's not as true now because the, there's new models to fix it, but sometimes you really crowd up and you didn't have much room. So the best way to play was actually try to play somehow tall and Khmer is doing really well at that. You build a few uh, aqueducts, you get your holy side district up. Suddenly you have so much housing that your capital grows very fast, very big. And with that comes the extra production. So you get both the fate that you can use as production eventually, or with for great people that you want to snipe, or and you get the extra production from having big cities. So, but this requires you to play defensively all the time as well. As but and then with that, also with the port that new religious lens, it tells you you'd see like, okay, this is how much pressure I'm putting on. This will convert in like 30 turns by its own, and let, that's a good like an extra helper to know you. Okay, maybe I don't need a missionary because this city is going to convert in eight turns according to the well, religious lens. This for sure helps, like if you're aiming to convert many cities. But often, uh, if you use faith in multiplayer, uh, it's not necessarily to convert that many cities unless you take a belief that gives you bonus. Like sometimes some beliefs gives you culture, gives you gold. Like uh, depending how many cities or citizens. There's that one. Yeah, there's that one pantheon that gives you culture. For like, if your thing is pumping out nine eighth faith, you get eight culture for it. That's the uh, I want to mention, bonus of the holy uh, site itself. Yeah, but like, if you take let's say the Khmer again, they have their also their special temple, and if you take this uh, well belief that gives culture, then suddenly you get a huge culture output, and this culture output comes with a faith bonus. But you're not doing it only because you want fit. You're doing it because you want culture. And with culture, eventually you'll get science, which also late game is a very important factor. So Khmer actually has a lot of potential. If you, but you have to place everything perfectly. Yeah, it helps you. So the culture, the culture bonus can help you rush to theology faster, which then can help you snowball the, yeah, if, you, if you do it correctly. So if you rush with theocracy, then suddenly you can buy with faith. If anybody wonders, it's 185 faith on online speed for your unique unit, the Domri, and you, uh, and then this allows many more strategies to come out of them. Like, so they can like any civilization that has a unit that cannot be pre-built, so cannot, it's not upgraded from a pre-existing unit, or like let's say like the Berserker from the Viking, the Garde Imperial, the Domri from for the uh, Khmer, then suddenly the fate takes much more sense because uh, the fate allows you with theocracy to buy those units. And also, the for, don't forget the warrior monks, which are not really that hardy on their own. But if you, if I heard, if you build them up and can get them to survive and use gurus to keep healing, they can get, they can get some pretty powerful yeah, units, they, right? They can get outright silly, but you need to be able to. And then, it's, and then if you get that that tech, there's that one tech that you can tech them up as they're doing combat with other units. They start spreading faith. So that you're well, helping to convert by just combat, which is pretty cool. Well, yes, you're right, but it's really hard and situational to be able to use warrior monks very effectively in multiplayer, as it is right now. You have to but have, you have, to have gurus, and you have change. to like, yeah, you have to have gurus, and you have to carefully train them and not let them die, so they build up to this uh, the high level that you're talking about. Yeah, but and you have really to use you have to use gurus to keep them alive. I, I didn't test it. I don't know if you, uh, maybe gurus heal, heal them. I just don't know about this. Yeah, they, I don't know how to use them either, but they're supposed I, but to I think heal they, them. I think they might not heal them. I think gurus only heal the apostles and missionaries, but I might be wrong. Oh, yeah, you know, I have to check on okay. that. But, uh, but really, like uh, the fate uh, play in multiplayer is not about converting like or healing those units. It's really about using your fate as production. And also one last thing that I've learned the hard way. If you're if you if you have a Yervon and you're trying to do religious, you gotta get that one. Because that lets you has the if you get the six and you have the most, you get to choose any upgrade for the apostles, which then one of them is like a seventy five percent uh you know convert a city, which it really is can be devastating. But but only Yervon that gives you the any any upgrade you want if you're the Caesarean, I think, with the six. Yeah. Or no, just like, Caesarean with the most of anybody else. And then you can choose. Because normally you just get these two and maybe both of them kind of suck. Or th that one you can choose every time. And 
I've seen that used against me, and it's it's devastating. I mean, just convert the. You think you've got this huge space city? It comes in seventy five percent gone, one shot. So two shots, your city's gone basically from an apostle. Yeah, it is true. But I think like coming back to Khmer, uh, the fact that they get relics out of their uh, missionaries, like it's actually really strong. And if you combine it with the different city states such as Candy which gives also relics, you can get a huge amount of relics. And there's a pantheon that also boosts the fate output. So it boosts the tourism and the fate of each relic. So if you do get that pantheon, get the missionaries and get those skills, then you can get a huge amount of fate. Yeah, so the, but, think, so these, but, are, these two new civs are like really cool, I think. I think people give them enough due. They're really like some a lot of different strategies for them. That's because Khmer requires a very unique play style. And if you don't mesh with that play style, you are not going to succeed with Khmer. You cannot play them like you would play America. You can't play Indonesia like you would play England. Like, a lot of people look at these civs and they try to apply the same strategy to every civ. They, no, and they're so they all trying all, to measure yeah. them by the golden yeah. standard and that is go, like oh, Khmer sucks, I can't. They go, Khmer sucks, I don't have any cool units, yeah. this sucks, and they just dump them. But that's because they don't know how to play with that civ. And that goes right back to me mentioning a skill ceiling in this game. Every Civ has its own unique play style that if you actually want to do well with, you have to bring that to the table. For example, France. France is regarded as the worst Civ in the game by pretty much everybody. I think it's even been joked about by Paraxis at one point that France is just the worst Civ in the game. But their spies are amazing. Hell, in the game I did with Blade last weekend, we did, uh, I was stealing with three spies, 600 gold per spy every three turns with each spy. So every three turns, give or take, in total, I was getting 1,800 gold. Do you have any idea how fast you could bankrupt a player doing that? It's yeah, that's, crazy. That's pretty, yeah. that's pretty devastating. But yeah, but but people don't ever figure that out, right? Because they never play it. That's because no one can ever survive to that point in the game of France, because they keep trying to well, play them like they're German. I'm trying uh, to actually. I'm putting up a new videos. I didn't put them yet, up yet, but I'm doing guides for how to play all those civs, like how to play Khmer, how to play France, and how even Norway, which is also joked about because they're really weak for many things. And if it does come out, I'll show you all the strategies because there's many very cool strategies you can do and still survive early game to have their bonuses really like. Uh, can I put a guide up on how to lose to Augusty using different different civs? Because I've done that <laughs> with like a couple different civs. As played civilizations that we should uh, we should value a little more. I think that's what I think. And, but um, I'm coming back again to the Khmer because like there's another thing we didn't mention. There's a new uh, well idea like the nukes ban is gaining in popularity again. I noticed there's more games with the nukes ban, but uh, even though the games don't often get to nukes, the Khmer uh, new unit actually upgrades straight into artillery. So if you do a phase. Yeah, to me You didn't spend a single production, and you suddenly have uh, an artillery which absolutely shreds cities. Uh, we don't see them during multiplayer because all those uh, siege units very, very hard to manipulate. Like if you try to attack somebody, it's going to focus it, and you cannot be, you won't be able to shoot it. But the difference is artillery. Will with balloons can be shot from three tiles away, or four. Like I, I don't know if they fixed that bug. I think they did, but you can shoot from three tiles away, and suddenly it cannot reach you. And then, if the nukes are banned, there's no way to conquer cities uh, other than having planes or artillery like that. So I think Khmer actually has a potential also in those games to uh, take over the late eras. I just want to give a, a humorous update on what's going on in the text lobby. Now, Estef apparently is in the 17 under staging area and said he's going to give away free wins for five games so he can get below 1,700. <laughs> well, that's his style, I guess. But I guess he wants to challenge himself. He's tired of being alone on the top of Mount Olympus. Yeah. 
and I think also Indonesia uh, has a few other bonus like the um, uh, well the agency bonus from the coast uh, does apply to all those districts as well. So in that way, in that sense, it's pretty little more like uh, some other civilizations like uh, Germany or like uh, Japan, which try to like focus on like having uh, districts at certain placements or even Brazil. So I think we should shout out like about this about the Khmer, which is really strong, really good. Okay, so let's talk. I'm going to talk about mods for a little bit. Mods have slowly been creeping up a little bit in CPO. Not to be mainstream or anything, but people have been talking about them for fun, fixing spawn locations. And uh, what mods do you guys use and play with? What do you, what do you guys see out there and about? And I'll mention some that I was ex I was exploring with this past week as well. When you got them. I haven't I, I haven't really used I've used the CQ UI one for you know so it shows you where production and everything more efficiently. But a lot of the time I think it's still kind of buggy, unfortunately. That's the only one I think I've used. I'm sure Agathy has used the spawn fixing bug, but I haven't played as many FFA. I probably used it too, but I just not because I have the automatic mod. But yeah, but other than that, I'm not that familiar with the uh, with any other mods. Maybe Agathy is probably more familiar. Did we lose somebody? Nope. I was just waiting to hear if Agathy played any mods. Oh, sorry. I'm not sure what happened. I'm back. We want to know if you played what mods you've been playing lately, if you have been playing any. Well, I tried a new mod. I don't know how much uh, you cast on my last sentence, but uh, uh, the new mod that tried to fix the spawn location. So it seemed to do a very good job, and it also seemed to allow uh, the civilization to spawn on their bias as intended. So, like, if you're like trying to play, uh, I don't know, like uh, England, you'll probably get on the coast, or uh, if you Indonesia, you'll get on the coast, or if you play uh, Gorgo, you'll get the hills that you would be expecting. You know, so I think it's doing a good, great job. But and is this cowgirl moves or ugly boys or? Which mod is this? I think some some maybe we're getting a little lag from Argothy or something. Let's we'll see. Uh, maybe, maybe he might have had to mute or something. But um, while well, while we're recovering Argothy's connection here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to talk about some of the mods I explored over the last week, and two of them being the more units and warfare expanded mod. And I'm actually going to drop the links for both of those here in just a second. I gotta drag. I'd uh, write them down separately because of uh, the Steam Workshop thing. Super picky. I'm going to put them into this chat right now for everybody. Now, you have to have more units to use Warfare Expand, but they both mods work in conjunction with each other to give all the sibs. A bunch of new units, of like unique units, and as well as warfare expanded, adding units that were you would think were missing from the tech tree, like things like riflemen or long swordsmen, composite bowmen. It adds units all over the eras that should be there for anyone who has any inkling on anything of how history is worked. Units you would expect to be there that just aren't. It don't make sense that they're not there. Is it pretty? Is it still balanced? Doesn't yeah the game or yeah? I did a gameplay video about an hour and a, an hour and a half, excuse me. And I had all sorts of stuff. I had trebuchets, riders, like actual horsemen, uh, long swordsmen, composite bowmen, regular swordsmen. Yeah, regular. I'll check. That sounds cool. I'll check that. Is did they have anything that helps you deal with cavalry early on? Did they add something? To yeah. That? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, the anti-cavalry units are actually where they should be throughout the eras. There are more light and heavy cavalry units as well. There's tons of variety, tons of different ways you can go. Is this like brand new, or are you just did you just find it recently? Um, I went through the workshop and I was looking at what some of the popular mods were over the last week and over the last month and three months, and I was comparing some demographs. And 
a couple mods really stood out compared to others, and I went to check them out to see why were they so popular. And I can see why. It takes a lot of the imbalances of the game, like the cavalry meta, for instance, and the amount of extra units added there can actually deal with them. Hell, they can even deal with Cossacks. And with the extra the extra uh, unique units that each Civ gets, like, for example, Japan, they get the Yamato battleship that they're known for in history, or the Sohei as a unit they can buy with faith. And it's there's just all this extra stuff there. For, so is that posted in the mods area of the Discord? Uh, no, I posted it into the live chat. So anyone who watches this video in the future or now, they'll see that those links pop up at this time. Cool, yeah, I'll check that out. It sounds like, so you could see that becoming popular here in the league? I, I don't know about that. Mod, we're not really big on mods for competitive play because we're, if we're going to back the use of a mod, we have to be really sure that it's actually balancing, actually fixing gameplay issues and not creating any. But you might get like a few like really dedicated players to, who agree to play with them a lot and really get into them. Well, I, sure. I, I if happen. all the players agree to the use of the mod, I mean, you can't cry about it later because you. So you to played it. it. How many? How many games have you played with this with this mod? Uh, three actually. Not in and the was, league, was, but I played them on my was own. Was it pretty? Was it pretty stable? No, no problem. Not too many problems. No, I had no problems at all. I had no errors, I had no problems loading in, no problems going all the way to turn. I think I stopped playing one of my games at turn 130. Had no problems. Yeah, so it's just like you found like a Easter egg or something, because people here just aren't looking in general for these mods, right? Yeah. P people aren't really looking for them in our league per se, but there are others in the community who love using mods. I mean, actually, for instance... You're, you're saying... You're saying actually it makes it like for a hardcore player, this could really be benefit them. They really appreciate if they know history well, they really appreciate this. Yeah, I mean, I I sure as hell did. I mean, yeah, I'll definitely check it out. That sounds cool. It sounds like even if it doesn't catch on, it sounds like it just be a fun like change of pace or more hardcore military strategy. There's a lot more options there. I highly encourage people to check it out. I think. What Mr. Roboto, hello? I can hear you now. Okay. So I was just saying, like, this mod sounds really great because, like, it fills up what... ...have units and, like, there's a one... Hey Louie, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I think yeah, August okay. is trying to is trying to tease he's trying to tease some strategies that he's only going to show at his own website or something. I think he's on purpose. <laughs> I just wanted to make I sure the issue wasn't was. my host connection. You keep cutting no, out a lot, you. Agathy. Yeah, That's all. Agathy is yeah, Agathy's cutting out a little bit occasionally. Just just at the end, we had no problems until just the, maybe the last like ten minutes. Yeah, it's really weird. Try um, uh, disconnecting from the call and rejoining. How about now? Can you hear? Uh... I, can, I can. I can hear it. I can, I can hear you fine. I can't hear him at all. Yeah, I don't I don't hear Agathy. But oh, he, he he, did he just did he hang up and try to come back in? Yeah, and he, it shows he's back in. Maybe he's getting a second headset. He said he had two. Um, but let's we'll move along and we'll come back to this when he gets back. Um. I have some more mods that were suggested to me by uh, some of the members that were watching when I started covering mods on the stream, and one of them was the introduction of the Austria, of Austria, and it's actually, it was, I was pretty impressed overall. It comes with another, 
Capcom mod pack, so to speak, in terms of uh, it adds, it makes it to where uh, you can place what the wonders, the built wonders, like Anchor Calm and Forbidden Palace, in more locations. And that's because I guess there was an issue with making the new wonders specifically for Austria to build that put into the game with it. It had trouble building it on tiles because the, the game coding wasn't recognizing it properly. But, uh, it, w it was different. It was a different approach on things. They play, it was a, a decent playthrough, but it didn't strike out to me as exceedingly amazing. Hey, apparently it's just, I gotta start going to that. I haven't gone there very much, the Steam Workshop, and just looking through. I, I haven't really, other than the CQ UI, I haven't really, like, just tried to really look through it. Sounds like there's lots of good, good mods there. Which is good. I'm happy to see. I thought I thought maybe the game was still not quite stable enough to make a lot of good mods, but it sounds like I w I'm wrong on that. I'm happy to say that, that, that there are a bunch of good mods. Yeah, there's tons of stuff out there being made by the community. And like, uh, here, I just fetched the link for the Austria mod that was some one of my viewers requested for me to play through. Here's the link for that. But uh, it's, it's just absolutely wonderful to see how much heart and soul gets put into some of these mods. A lot of them are not simple and by no means were really easy to make. I mean, maybe they are for someone who actually knows how to do it. But for, you know, average Joes like you and I, it's, it's kind of magic making. Yeah, just a little more, especially these people in the league that have played like two, three thousand hours. I'm sure they would they would appreciate even more just something different. Well, that that's for them to decide, but the options do exist out there. People just have to be willing to try it. Welcome back. Oh no, he's yeah. I'll get hey. Back. So I restarted the whole thing, so it should be okay. Not sure what happened. So I missed the whole mud thing, I guess. Uh, you did, but let's go back to where you left off. Now, you were trying to talk to us about, I do believe, what mods do you like to play with? Oh no, is it cutting out again? I don't I don't hear anything. Uh -huh. Well due to technical difficulty, Agathy has uh I guess uh, jumped off a cliff metaphorically speaking. But he'll get back to us when he can. We're going to move on to the uh, Clan KC's uh, training event. That's on Tuesday, November 28th at 5 p.m. Eastern. This one's actually during the week for those of you out there that haven't been able to do weekends. I definitely encourage you guys to come out and learn with the community. I know I'm going to be there if at all possible. Because I love, I just love seeing what the clans come up with every time. Yeah, it's, a, it's the uh, 20, 28th, right? And yep. is it is it going to be similar to the Sun Z one, beginners, intermediates, or is it focused on one particular group? Or I don't know. They've actually kind of kept this one under wraps, at least as far as what I've been told. So they might have something really big surprise for people. And that is the oldest uh, clan, right? Formed formed by our founder Canuck Soldier. This is the oldest clan in the league, obviously. Yes. <laughs> Did this did this exist back in the Civ? I don't know that back in the Civ three days. I don't know. I wonder how old. I'm just curious how old it is. You would have to ask him. Although I'm pretty sure he's watching, so he might throw something in the chat to let us know. And this, and if you are listening, Canuck, we're asking how old the Clan Knights of Civilization is, not how old you are. We don't need to know when you know the color TV came. Out. <laughs> shots, shots fired. Fire. Shots shots fired. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. I'm old enough to rem- I'm old enough to remember those TVs where you could actually you could also turn the TV on by clanging quarters together. So you know I'm right at that right around the Canucks age too. <laughs> you had like little sh- <laughs> you go like, and you could you could also just bang two quarters together and it would also turn the channel. It'd be like trunk trunk. It was like it really uh, it was <laughs> yeah it's ancient. It was I mean it was back then it was the old TV back when I was a little kid. So this was yeah. So I, I, I it wasn't I'm not that old where I didn't remember color TVs but. I'm just saying, like I can remember, I can remember a ways back. Definitely, I played the original Civ. I know that. Oh yeah, but on that note, I think we can. We're at a pretty good spot to wrap up here for this week's episode. Big thanks to everyone who came out to watch, and if you're watching this after it's uploaded, a big thanks for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoy the content as much as we do making. Yeah, thanks for listening, and we're, we will. As starting to see you guys, see you guys next time. I, I gotta step it up. I let you do it. You you end with it because it's your <laughs> thing. All right, guys. Thanks for stopping by. Hope you enjoyed yourselves, and we'll see you guys next time.